Thank you, Amy. Ellie made me promise to tell you that the way that you RSVP for that dinner, if you want to go, you can email Miriam Garrick or Roche or call into the church office. So there you have it. You know, I had a gentleman come to my office a couple of years ago here at our church, a dear friend, one of our beloved leaders, who came to me and said that he felt like a fraud, that he felt like he was a counterfeit Christian and inadequate leader because he had all of these doubts and questions that he had never been able to talk to anyone about. And so I asked him, what is it that you question?" And he said, well, you know, the deity of Christ, the miracles, the resurrection, the virgin birth. I felt like I was listening to this Apostles' Creed that we just recited in reverse. It kind of went on and on, you know, like, I don't believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, or in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. I do not believe in the resurrection of the body or the life everlasting. And the thing that killed me was the entire time he was telling me this, he had such a pained expression of anguish on his face. Like he was ashamed and embarrassed. And it absolutely broke my heart. You know, this is another one of the reasons that I've been dying to preach this sermon series for so long now. Because... All the time, I have you all come up to me and say things just like that. Say, you know, I'm really not a very strong Christian. I have lots of questions about my faith. Or I don't know why you would even consider me for being an elder or a deacon. I, I still struggle with doubts. I consider myself a baby Christian because I don't have it all figured out the way that you all do. And every time one of you says something like that, I, I feel like I want to scream from the hilltops, first of all, what made you think that we have it all together, that we have any idea of all of the answers and all of what's going on? I hope we're not giving that impression. But the other thing I want to say is, you know, and that is exactly the kind of leaders we need here at this church. I would choose someone who's struggling with questions and doubts over someone who's absolutely certain and thinks they have it all figured out ten times out of ten. Not only to be elders and deacons and ministry leaders, but as colleagues and, and parishioners and friends. These are the kind of people I feel comfortable with. For people of faith, when people of faith start to seem too sure, too certain of all of their beliefs, like they have it all figured out, bad things begin to happen. Way too often, people who are too sure, they can become arrogant and glib, judgmental and dismissive. You know, the Christian faith has been getting a really bad rap in recent years, and I think partially for very good reason. You're probably one of the things, the strongest arguments against becoming a Christian nowadays is the judgmentalism and the arrogance of many of our Christians. I don't know if you've seen the bumper sticker that says, Jesus, save me from your followers. <laughs> kind of similar to what Gandhi said. Remember, he said, I love your Christ. I'd become a Christian if only your, your Christians weren't so unlike your Christ. Or the comic strip that shows St. Peter welcoming a new arrival at the pearly gates, and they seem to be having this animated debate right there at the gates as he's trying to get entrance. And finally, St. Peter puts his foot down and says, Yes, I know you're a believer, but somewhere along the line you skip that whole not being a big fat jerk about it. I want to be as clear as I can here. Your doubts and your questions, they're not just okay. They're important. They're important. 
Or should I say it this way, that there are some important things, some important benefits that come out of your questions and your doubts. Like humility. Being open about our questions and our doubts about the things that we struggle with, it keeps us humble. It keeps our hearts soft. It gives us patience and empathy with those who are struggling to figure out what they believe or if they believe at all. Those who are closest to Christ's heart, that Christ most wants to draw close to himself. I don't know if you remember this scripture passage from Luke. Suppose one of you is a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. I hope you understand that it's our humility, not our arrogance, that welcomes people who are struggling with their faith, that helps the shepherd to find the lost sheep. How many of you, just a quick show of hands, are here today because someone treated your doubts and your questions with patience and humility? Anybody? Yeah. Our doubts and our questions make us humble. But they also make us honest. They teach us not to just check our brain at the door and to accept hook, line, and sinker, whatever I say, whatever the churches says, whatever the people around us say. Our doubts and questions, they remind us that there is a lot of bad theology out there and that there are always going to be preachers and pastors and priests and gurus who are willing to peddle anything that we want to hear. Like that God wants us all to be filthy rich or that any disease can be curable if we just have enough faith. That anyone who doesn't believe exactly like us is going to hell or that God is on our side, whether it's our country's side or our army's side or our team's side. It's a lot of work to be honest about our faith, but our questions and our doubts help us to put truth first over what we've been told to believe. One of the most intriguing lines in the entire Bible comes when Pontius Pilate is talking and interrogating Christ during the trial. Do you remember this? Do you remember this passage from John 18? Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning, and they themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Good answer. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. And the Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again and summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? And Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation, the chief priests, have handed you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So are you a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And then Pilate asked him, what is truth? There it is. 
What is truth? One of the most intriguing lines in the entire scripture. And for years and years, scholars and theologians have debated and argued and tried to figure out what was the tone? What was the attitude of that simple question? I mean, I could really go either way, right? And either way it goes would make all of the difference in what was going on inside of Pilate's heart and his mind as he was asking that. I mean, it could be an absolutely sincere plea. He's in front of Jesus. He realizes there's something special about this guy, and so he's a seeker, and he humbly asks, tell me, please, what is truth? Or else it could be the other way, right? With a tone, a hint of sarcasm, cynicism, the way so many people today are tempted. What is truth? Give me a break. Isn't all truth just relative? I mean, whose truth are we talking about? Your truth? My truth? CNN's truth? Fox's truth? MSNBC's truth? I mean, isn't truth totally relative depending on where you grew up and what nation you belong to and what people you belong to and political party and what day of the week is? You'd have to forgive Pilate if this was the tone in his voice because he certainly had been set up for it. Pilate was the fifth prefect of the Roman province of Judea, the most important and powerful man who ran that area, and he had had a tough time of it. His entire job was about trying to hold together these wildly divergent ideas of what the truth was, to keep the Romans off his back, to keep the Jews out of his face, and if we're going to listen to the historians, the Jewish secular historians of the time, he hadn't been doing a very good job at it. When he first came in in 26 AD, the first thing he did is he had his soldiers march into Jerusalem with shields and banners with Caesar's image on it. An absolute no-no to the Jews, almost caused a riot. Not long after that, he took money out of the temple fund to try to build a public aqueduct. He thought it was something the, the city needed, and so he thought it would be okay. Again, almost caused a revolution. In fact, just before this interaction with Jesus, Pilate had just been called back to Rome to be publicly chewed out for not being sensitive enough to the nuances of everybody's truth. So you can sort of imagine him saying, give me a break. What is truth? Whose truth are we talking about? You can almost imagine him settling for a version of the truth that simply covers his butt that keeps the peace and keeps him in power. And if that is the way that he's saying this, you'd have to forgive him because doesn't that happen to all of us? That life has a way of just knocking the idealism out of us until we're all accepting the truth that we're expected to accept for our country or our people or our church or our denomination, whatever it is. It's hard to put truth first, to stand up against the status quo of our religion or political party or whatever it is. You know, it's interesting that when you really stop to think about it, this was Jesus' entire mission, wasn't it? His entire purpose, A to Z, for coming here was to question and, and doubt all of the traditions of the faith that he had grown up with, the faith of his family and his culture and his community. That's all he did was question and question and challenge and doubt. He says over and over again throughout the scriptures that he came to put truth first. It wasn't just in this interaction with Pilate where he says, everyone who's searching for the truth, they're going to listen to me. He says it over and over again. John 8, 31. If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. And then you will know the truth. And the truth. Not me, not a new religion. The truth will set you free. Then again, John 14. I am the way and the truth and the life. And then again, John 16. But when he, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. It's, this is not, this is all through the Gospels, over and over. Jesus is always saying stuff like this. You know, I have become convinced that if, 
If you were given a choice to have to pursue Jesus or pursue the truth, Jesus would be the first one to say he wants you to pursue the truth. Because he's convinced, and I'm absolutely convinced as well, that you can't pursue the truth too long or too hard, make it too much of a priority before you find yourself right back at Jesus' feet. This is not the way that Mark Twain talks about faith. That faith is trying to believe what you know ain't so. (laughs) This is about an honest, intellectual pursuit of what is most real and most true in the universe. Of who we are and why we're here and what's important and what actually matters and what kind of life we could be living and how to get there. I always feel so sorry for people who push down their doubts and their questions because they're scared that if they entertain them, if they even ask them or look at them in the face, that somehow it's going to undermine or destroy their faith as if they're not really sure that what Jesus Christ is saying is true. And if it's not true, they'd just as well rather not know it. For the people who aren't willing to read or hear or listen to any of the unbelievers, the secular scientists, the evangelical atheists, because they're scared that it's going to shake their faith. If our God is the God of truth, then there are no questions, there are no doubts that God doesn't want us to be pursuing, because the more we dig, the more we study, the more we learn, the deeper we go, the closer we're going to end up getting to God. Our questions and our doubts, they make us humble. Our questions and our doubts, they make us honest. They also help us to know what we really believe and don't believe. Once again, as I said, there's a lot of bad theology out there, and there are a lot of people who are willing to tell us whatever it is that we want to hear. But our doubts and our questions, they keep us searching. They keep us studying. Uh, Frederick Buechner was the one who said that doubts are the ants in the pants of our faith. They keep our faith moving. I heard a story recently about a Christian college that required all of its professors to sign a document with all of the things that the college believed, all the little doctrines, and to swear that they believed the same thing or they were going to lose their jobs. And some of the doctrines were some pretty shaky stuff like premillennialism. And after this one professor signed the document, his friend, another professor, was saying, so do you really believe? You really believe in premillennialism? And this professor said, you know, my belief in premillennialism, it hangs by a very thin economic thread. Our doubts and our questions, they help to keep us true. They they tip us off when some of our theologies and our beliefs are selfish or self-serving or arrogant or silly. They help us to believe. They help us to figure out, to unpack our faith, to tear it apart and put it back together, to question, to study, to figure out what we believe and what we don't believe. And finally, our questions and our doubts They teach us how to trust. Because isn't that what faith is all about? After all, it's it's believing in something, it's trusting in something that we can't possibly be 100% sure about. I mean, isn't that what the author of Hebrews meant in Hebrews 11.1 when he says, faith is confidence in what we hope for. Confidence in what we hope for. And assurance about what we do not see. Next Sunday morning, 22 big, strong, strapping men from Seattle and from Denver are going to be heading out onto the football field to fight it out to figure out who is the best football team in the entire world. I am so bad at Roman numerals. What is that? 48? Super Bowl 48 between the Seahawks and the Colts. And there is going to be a lot of drama and a whole lot of plots. What did I just say? Colts, sorry. 
It's the horse thing. I meant the Broncos. Didn't mean that. And there is going to be a whole lot of drama and a whole lot of plots and subplots on that field. Like, who's going to be the best quarterback, the young upstart Russell Wilson or the old veteran Peyton Manning? We're going to get to decide which, which Richard Sherman we're going to see out on the field this coming week. The Stanford-educated, polite guy or the loud-mouthed brute from last week. We'll get to see if uh, Jermaine Curse, the boyfriend of Marissa, Mark and Joyce Mickelson's niece, who's here staying with us, if he will uh, catch another amazing touchdown pass in the end zone or break another poor guy's leg. And all of this will take place to figure out the world's greatest sporting event. Who, who is going to be able to have the bragging rights of the best in the world? And not just the bragging rights, but that ever so coveted, understated piece of jewelry. <laughs> the Super Bowl ring. More highly prized after than the Hope Diamond. If you have any questions about that, you can just ask this man. <laughs> but what would you say if I were to tell you that without training, without any talent, that I, here with my sprained ankle in the warmth of Los Angeles, have not one, but two of these Super Bowl rings right here in my hand. Would you believe me? <laughs> Thank you very much. Do you trust me? Do you have faith? You know, there is, there's a certain kind of intimacy, isn't there? In giving our trust, it's a gift. It's something we give. It's in giving our trust to someone to believe something that we can't know 100% for sure. It makes us vulnerable, doesn't it? It really is quite an intimate act. It's like when a young couple stands up here and, and gets married to each other and they make these promises and these vows to each other that for the rest of their lives they're going to be there for each other through thick and thin, better or worse, sickness and death. And of course, they can't know everything that's going to be coming up in the future. They can't be sure that something's not going to get in the way. They are... They're making the best promises they can with all of the sincerity and all of the heart that they can. But one of the things that makes it such an intimate moment, such a powerful moment, is the trust that they give each other as a free gift. Not because they know, but because they believe. Are you ready for me to ruin your faith in me? There they are. Two of them. Pretty amazing, huh? This thing fits well around my thigh. <laughs> of course, these are Willie Davises, member of our church. Good looking young guy there, not too shabby now either. All time Hall of Fame, famous defensive end from the Green Bay Packers, won the first. Five Super Bowls in a row. In fact, this is kind of a ripoff. This is the first one he got for the first three national championships, 64, 65, and 66. And then this one here, which is the size of King Kong's ring, is, uh, is one that he got more recently as a board of, one of the board of trustees when they had a more recent win. But there it is. These beautiful, amazing, unbelievable rings. But do you know why I said that it was going to ruin your faith in me? Because once you know, once you see it, once you're absolutely certain and there is no more question, the trust is no longer relevant. 
the faith disappears. Every time that I think, gosh, I wish I was more certain about everything in my faith, I have to remind myself that trust is more important than certainty. And that the intimacy of faith is much better than the coolness of absolute knowledge. When someone says, I'm not a strong Christian because I have questions or doubts, I say you're a stronger Christian because of your questions or doubts. Not only are you a stronger Christian, but you're a better kind of Christian. You are the kind of Christian that Jesus would want to hang out with, that I would want to hang out with, that the people who Jesus is most wanting to reach out to in this world would want to hang out with and be around and talk to. People I know, their faith is much stronger if they're open and honest about their struggles and their doubts. I know that mine is. Because our questions and our doubts, they make us humble. Not only do they make us humble, but they, they help us to be honest, to put truth first ahead of everything. They help us to figure out what it is, exactly what it is that we believe and don't believe about our faith. And then finally, they teach us to trust. To trust in God, to trust in these things that we hope for. And that is the whole point of faith, after all, isn't it? And then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Thank you for listening.